Hi, I'm Stephen Bornstein. I'm the director of the Center for Applied Health Research, and it's a pleasure to welcome you to Research Matters. Today, we are privileged to have a special guest from Ontario, Dr. Ann Snowden, uh, who has probably been taunted recently for spelling her name wrong, <laughs> given that there's another Snowden who is even more famous these days. Uh, Dr. Snowden is a professor at the Richard Ivey School of Business at the university formerly known as the University of Western Ontario, now known as Western University. Uh, she's a professor of business, although her, tra her training is in nursing, where she has her degrees from three different universities, Western, McGill, and Ann Arbor, Michigan. Uh, she has a number of quite interesting appointments, including cross appointments, joint appointments, adjunct appointments in a variety of faculties, including engineering, uh, quite interesting, uh, and in several universities. She is at Western, she is the scientific director of the International Center for Health Innovation and this is the crucial component of what she does. She's working on getting health systems to adopt technological innovations that would actually make them more effective, efficient, and financially sustainable. Uh, it sounds totally obvious, but it is not, and takes an enormous amount of energy and imagination, and you are about to see what that amounts to. Dr. Stone. Thank you. Stephen, thank you very much. It is a pleasure to be here, and thank you for coming out on a very busy time of year and um, just before holidays, and of course, marking and all those good things. I had only 75 papers land in my inbox this afternoon, so I appreciate anyone who can uh, take, a, take a moment to uh, spend the evening with us. Uh, what I'd like to share with you is some of the work we're doing at the uh, center and just a very quick snapshot. Our center is funded by Industry Canada. Interesting that Industry Canada is funding a center for health innovation. The mandate is to be a catalyst for health innovation and the real objective here is to create and develop economic value. And I'll explain that in just a moment. Uh, Canada is one of those countries that's got a very interesting track record second most highly educated popula population in the world, top four in producing new knowledge, new devices, new technologies, new models of health service delivery, on the bottom of the 17 countries who are last evaluated for innovation in terms of taking that new knowledge and embedding it into our health systems. So hence, the government of Canada sees an opportunity for economic development here and through health being one of the largest businesses in the world. So this work that I'm going to talk about tonight is asking the question, are health systems in Canada really delivering value to the populations they serve? And, and how do we know that? And how might we think about what we do in health systems a little bit differently to achieve much greater value for the populations we serve? So start with what is health in Canada and how is it different from some of the other countries? No question, Canadians carry their health system like the Americans carry their flag. It is very near and dear to the, our hearts. We are deeply proud of this system. It's a very, very good system. But the question is, is it accomplishing all the things it could, given the strengths as a population uh, we bring to that system? It is no question how systems are, tr are transforming towards much more consumer-centered models. I'll tell you a little bit some, about some of that work. But the question we really wanted to ask in this work, and the, uh, this was a white paper we published last year, was how are we delivering on the value proposition? And when the business schools talk about that, they'd say, what's the return on investment? So given the money we're putting into health systems, are we really getting the, the, the uh, value that Canadians are hoping for, aspire to achieve, and are d expecting from this system in terms of what they're funding it for? So we ask the following questions. What do Canadians value? Unless you know what Canadians value, you can't possibly know whether a health system's actually delivering value. Are Canadian health systems costs and performance measures aligned with values? In other words, a good old phrase from, again, business schools. 
can't measure if you can't, ma if you can't manage what you can't measure. So are we even measuring the value proposition our health systems provide to Canadians? And are values aligned with how we fund health systems? Good old, another good old phrase, follow the money. So are we really funding what people are expecting and hoping to achieve from health systems? And then I'll spend a little bit of time looking at how do we line up with other OECD countries, particularly countries with publicly funded systems. So how did we go about this? Well, the first thing we did to answer the question, what do Canadians value, is what do we know now and what can we then build on with the current state of knowledge? And it turns out we have a massive number of reports, Romano being one of about 72 last time I checked. And the majority of those all look at primarily polling data. So they get random digit dialing surveys out to most Canadians, representative population, and ask them what do they hope for and value most in their health systems. So we started there and we looked at that. And I'll show you a few of those, uh, those outcomes. But the next thing we did was we looked at every health organization, whether it was a hospital, community organization, policymaker kinds of group like Ministry of Health, or health professional organization, and we looked at their mission, vision, and values. The reason we did that was we saw that as a good proxy for what they value if they've determined their values in an organization in terms of what's the basis for whether you're a health professional practicing medicine, nursing, pharmacy, et cetera, or whether you're a hospital delivering acute care services. So what we found was some very interesting values embedded in those four different groups, and you'll probably be interested about how those actually vary. The other thing we had to do was you, better, you have to define values. So when you, we defined value, the best definition we could find that we felt was really authentic to what we were after was the values are unique to each individual and organization. They're often learned, and they are most definitely influenced by our experiences. If we have a phenomenally, tremendously positive experience with a hospital emergency room, we tend to hold that up as the gold standard for uh, emergency rooms. So values in this study was a quality based on a person's principles or standards, one's judgment about what they see as valuable and important in life, and what a person or what a person deems important. The reports we looked at, just very quickly, this is just a snapshot, but these are the ones that are most heavily cited and most heavily used across the country and are referenced also most heavily. So one of the things we did was, uh, was look at very carefully the importance that Canadians place on the, each of the five principles of the uh, Canada Health Act. And the one that's really at the very, very top here is universality. Everybody has the same and equal access uh, to care that every other, everybody else does. And then the second one, but it's pretty even money, is access and to some degree uh, portability. And those are deemed as highly or very important by the majority of Canadians, upwards of 85, 90%. That, and that's very much part of why Canadians value their health system uh, so dearly. Where do they rank healthcare in terms of a priority and a performance? So if you look on that x-axis, in terms of low priority, they would see it as extremely high in priority, but they also see it as relatively poor in performance. So Canadians, and it was remarkable how report after report after report over spanning probably two decades, the Canadians are well aware that the health system could do much better, and it's crystal clear that they value this, outcome, this health system very dearly. Two most important things in the Mendelssohn Report, which is actually one of the more recent ones, there's only one other report in 2007, that Canadians identify in terms of what they're uh, hoping to achieve in health care is enhancing quality of life and promoting health and wellness. So those are substantively more important than, as you see on the very far right of your screen, prevent, providing life-extending treatment. When you look at where we put resources into our health systems, the majority of the health costs per capita in most provinces are spent in the last two years of life. So they tend to be life-extending. They're very expensive, complex, mostly hospital-based. In Ontario, there's an interesting study where 1% of the population is consuming very close to 50% of the healthcare utilization costs. 5% are consuming almost 70%. So a relatively small population is really, uh, whoops, um, really consuming 
uh, the majority of the resources. Whoops, I've got all kinds of things. Sorry. I'm hitting buttons. I don't mean to. So when we looked at this analysis and we looked at all of those uh, mission, vision, value statements in hospitals, here's what came out. No question the most dominant value people look towards hospital care is what I called, broadly speaking, excellent care. What's really important is how do, you, how do they define excellent care? The most common statements that we found were collaborative care partnerships focused on quality of life. So that value towards quality of life, health, and wellness, very central, came out in this analysis and validated the polling data in crystal clearly. But how they see achieving that quality of life value is through a collaborative care partnerships. And just some of the excerpts from value statements in these hospitals across the country are successful relationship with patients as partners in decisions, families participate as a member of the healthcare team, Human dignity, human rights, honor the individual and achieve the highest possible quality of life. So no question, quality of life is a very significant outcome. A second feature of it is integrated and accountable quality of care. So fully integrated, meets the highest standards, commitment to excellence. What's fascinating was not much of a definition of what they meant by integrated, but clearly quality at the highest possible available. The second interesting, very common value was organizational reputation. And a lot of that has to do with that Canadian identity. Canadians actually see themselves, uh, the credibility of their community is actually tied to their perception and image of the health, and usually it's a hospital. Very, very often in many smaller communities whose hospitals are struggling with maintaining enough medical staff to staff them undergo phenomenal pushback from their communities if they try to close emergency room or they close the obstetric program. And it's because the identity of that community is so tied to having a fully functioning, all the bells and whistles kind of a hospital organization. They very much, however, also see community accountability as front and center. The, fourth, the second part of that is quality work environments. They want that organization, that hospital in their community to be viewed as an organization everybody wants to work in. So work environments are very, very important, respecting differences, supporting employees to achieving and maintaining a healthy lifestyle. It's fascinating though when you look at some of what we do in the hospital sector across many provinces, don't see a lot of strategic plans focused on work environments, health and wellness of their, their staff. So that, this is an interesting one that's quite different from the reality of hospitals. Less often, which is somewhat surprising, is the value of excellence through discovery and knowledge translation. Respected cultural and heritage values, of course, there are many hospitals that come from very specific uh, cultural heritage, the, the Catholic hospital system, in some case of Montreal, the Jewish uh, hospital system. Sacredness of life, mind, body, soul, again, that's very, very similar and maps into this quality of uh, life kind of value cultural diversity and cultural sensitive. And the only, and one of the last things on the value list of uh, possibilities is health system sustainability. So it's surprising given the amount of money we're spending on healthcare, we know it's not a sustainable system. It's not very, very as high as I would have expected on that, that list. So how does it look different in the community organizations? And when you think about it, our whole continuum of care in terms of, uh, of healthcare Need, when you say integrated, those all need to be working together. If you look at the value proposition and the organizations and communities and compare those to hospitals, it's a very different look. So one of the most central values in community organizations is community governed, community centered. The governance ensures that the community health, the health of that community is enhanced. And that's what they hold accountable to these organizations. Advance again, health and wellness, but this is at a community level. Equity, accessibility, very, very common second and very important value that the access, the participation, and the equity, and the inclusion is very important. And again, third on the list, integrated healthcare. So we talk a lot about integrated healthcare, but we still see this very siloed across these different organizations. Third group of organizations, we looked at every province, all the professional organizations, primarily nurses and physicians. Um, but some other, uh, allied health as well, and then we looked at the national group. Three very clear value statements common to all of them. It was almost as though 
one person wrote the value statements and they all adopted them. I don't know if that's actually true, but the consistency was tremendous. No question number one, value is leadership. When you look at the second, advocacy and professionalism, what's really clear on our health professional organizations is the value is focused on the discipline itself. It's very inward focused. It's about our ability to be leaders, advocate for patient-centered approach and quality of care, and trust, fairness, and integrity as practitioners. So again, quite different from the community organizations, different again from the hospital. Policymakers, the one we're all uh, often looking to for leadership, four values very clearly. Number one, patient experience. Maps onto, of course, the political agenda. People get elected in this country based on their ability to manage or to show leadership in healthcare. So meeting the needs of patients and families and looking at patient experience is very important for policymaker value systems. The fascinating thing is the only thing we actually measure in terms of patient experience is something called patient satisfaction. And in the hospitals in Ontario, it's a single item on a survey that asks, would you recommend this hospital to your family, friends, and neighbors? The real interesting part of that is, is there a choice? <laughs> because in many communities, there is only one hospital. But having said that, there's lots of work being done now on patient experience. Health teams is the second value because, of course, that's very important that you have a sustainable system in order to have health teams and working in an environment of trust and team as partners in care. Now, interesting, the policymakers in every ministry of health in the country identify partners in care not there in the hospitals, not in the communities who are actually the service delivery organization. So very interesting distinction in value systems uh, in each of these organizations. Health system stewardship makes sense. We have limited resources. Are we using them wisely? And innovation and collaboration, unfortunately near and dear to my heart, doesn't show up anywhere except in policymakers, and it's on the bottom of the list. However, we're hoping to get that moving a little bit better. So really, when you look at what a Canadian's value and you compare across health professional values, policymakers, and patients, providers in the center, it's quality of life, health, and wellness through collaborative partnerships with providers, community governance and equity, and sustainable integrated models of care. So do Canadian values then align with how we're funded? Probably not. So when you look at how we're funding, funding models tend to, be influ tend to really influence um, funding um, allocations and decision-making, fee-for-service is still one of the most common funding mechanisms for physicians. It's a volume-driven model. The more volume, the more um, uh, income. It is not attached to quality, and it's most definitely atta not attached to performance. There's lots of moving decisions and trying on for size and experimental, uh, experimentation, actually, in funding models across a number of organizations. Batching funding for around patients is um, relatively new and almost undefinable so far, but at least some of the thinking and the dialogue is happening. Is funding linked to values? Probably not. Uh, I think I took that slide out. When you look at what that, um, funding according to are you achieving quality health and wellness in a population? Are you achieving access and equity? The only the remote funding is around wait times and in terms of access and nothing around certainly the quality of uh, life, health, and wellness. So no, clear, no question, funding models are not aligning with values. Values across the continuum of care, completely different when you looked at the different groups. So trends in health spending, this is no surprise, health spending is rapidly outpacing our gross domestic product. This is the same in every country in the OECD group. Our private out-of-pocket spending is increasing at a similar rate, not quite as high, is our public spending, and the majority of that public spending in hospitals are in, in majority of health systems in Canada are related to two things. Hospitals, which, let me just see where, which is, sorry, I'm looking for my, oh, sorry. Uh, that's hospitals, so really significant part of the uh, funding models. And the second one is physicians. Now, interestingly, physicians in Canada are among the most highly paid physicians among the OECD group. Um, the other interesting thing about physicians is they're highly paid, but the visits, physician visits per capita in Canada are declining. It's the only country, we're the only country in the world where they're declining, 
rather than going up. And that's based on OECD data only. So to really understand how is it they're the most highly paid, but the rates of visits per capita declining uh, is an interesting question, one we probably should look at. Public health has remained relatively stable, if not had any increases. And then the other, uh, the other one, of course, is physicians. And drugs have remained relatively stable, mostly because we're managing what drugs get on the formulary. And they don't change drastically unless now they're looking at what do you take, put on, what do you take off. So how do the values align with funding? Not really at all. The excellent care, quality of life does align with our hospital costs, inputs, if you look at it that way. Physicians, are our, our um, Canadian values around advocacy, leadership, professionalism. Um, there is really a very significant misalignment, um, and really that's one of the questions as to are we delivering on the value proposition. We're not funding along those values, and we're certainly not measuring uh, them either. Measures of performance, just a quick snapshot of CHI-HI. This is the Canadian information, uh, Health Information System, and this is what gets reported, of course, to the Commonwealth Fund and the OECD group. And we measure four things largely, effectiveness, patient safety, accessibility and appropriateness, and financial performance. So we certainly measure cost, and we measure a lot about cost. We know a lot about how the cost per case, the cost of wait times, the cost of not receiving care. We have much less in our effectiveness looks at mortality, readmissions usually, um, patient safety, falls, injury, events, net errors. It does not map onto, of course, the values of uh, Canadians. If you look at Canadian values in terms of excellent care, the closest thing you can get to is the safety measures. In terms of organizational reputation, only patient satisfaction would be the only single performance measure. And then, of course, uh, complete misalignment. So when you ask the question, are we measuring what matters? And does it map onto Canadian values? The answer is not really. When we looked at uh, Canada, we looked at Canadian values, but then I thought, well, is Canada vastly different than other OECD groups? So we went in and looked at the value, mission, vision, value statements of just the Ministry of Health of other countries. And what's interesting here is Canada talks about excellent care, quality of life, you know, community governed, sustainable, those good things. When we looked at the OECD group of countries, one of the most common value was active, healthy, active living. So in our OECD current country partners, they clearly identify something much closer to quality of life, health, wellness, if you assume that healthy and active living maps onto that. Patient choice and equity, not too unlike our community organizations. Health literacy never shows up in any of the value statements in Canada, but clearly a very common value in the OECD group. And of course, quality health services are the same. So one of the interesting questions then is, what are these other countries doing that we could learn from? We're clearly spending more money than the majority of them, and I, showed, I talked about that a little bit this morning. We spend among the highest, but our performance outcome measures with these other groups are actually among the poorest. So we're not getting the quality outcomes. Uh, we're, um, as as uh, Jeffrey Simpson said in his latest book, we're spending Cadillac money, and we're actually getting a Chevy in terms of our quality outcomes. So what is a, we looked at OECD comparisons in terms of what are they doing in health system innovation? What can we learn from? And what are some of these global innovation trends? So let me give you a round the world tour very quickly of some of the things and you'll start to see the trends and some of these common themes um, very quickly. One of the things that matters in terms of health system innovation is how is the health system organized? When I looked at the structure and governance of health systems in this OECD group, there's really three types. Ours is in the center, and it's best described as state as owner operator. So every province in our country is essentially the, the Ministry of Health is the CEO for the system. They decide how services get funded, how much global budget each hospital gets, who pays for whether the drug is uh, provided or not, and all those good things. So it's based on a principle of universality. The elected officials, the Ministry of Health bureaucracy decide to make sure everybody gets equal access to care to the degree that's possible. And the population is essentially the recipient of care. You go to the hospital in your community. If there isn't one, you do your best to get something as close as possible. Now compare that, and Australia and the UK are very similar. Compare that to France, Switzerland, Germany, Netherlands which is the state as the guardian. 
essentially in those countries what they do is they define the health services every citizen should be entitled to receiving. But they don't actually deliver those services. They actually download that to a series of social insurance companies where the consumer selects, I want that model that includes A and B and C more so than I want that one. So I want this one because it includes a dermatology check once a year, and that's the one that they will purchase. The state pays for all the state sanctioned services, and they add the ones they particularly want. What that means is consumers negotiate for the health service delivery they want. They have a role in deciding, I want that kind of care from that kind of team, and I, and I will choose that social insurance system. It's a very different driver because it introduces the notion of competition. So if one group, and in some of these countries, I think it's uh, Germany, there's 180 of these companies competing for selling that particular health insurance. They will compete on quality, performance, and outcomes very dramatically. In our system, and Australia and UK, we don't have the competitive. You get what you get, and everybody, you do your best to get the same. The US, hard to know what to say about the US. The US is that mixed privatized model. If you're in Kaiser Permanente, it's one version. The VA has another phenomenal version, Intermountain Health, and then there's 44 million people that have absolutely nothing. So it's a very mixed model, highly technology focused and specialist care. Whenever you, women's health is all looked after by the most you know, highly trained specialist, primary care doesn't fold into that equation quite as readily as it does the others. So innovation in each, so think about that structure and then how innovation has started to unfold in these countries. Netherlands have two or three things that are interesting. They have many, but these are the ones that, that are relevant. Dutch personal health budgets. So every consumer has a health budget and they use that budget to negotiate the health services they wish. Again, introduces the notion of people being at the center of deciding on the health care they want and need and are willing and, and engage in um, and purchase from that health service uh, system. They coordinate and manage systems. They have an after hours primary care physician cooperative 24 7 to answer all calls and home visits and adhere, they must adhere to quality standards. They are salaried. 90% of patients are seen within a 60 minute time frame. If they're urgent, 70% of cases are seen in 15 minutes. They actually travel around in well-outfitted vehicles with all the equipment and all those things they need, and they go right to the home when they're needed. There is virtually no wait time in, in Netherlands, and their hospital occupancy bed rates run about 60%. When we looked at uh, occupancy rates in Canadian hospitals, well over 100 in many cases, and they're the highest in the world. Innovation in France, similar. SOS Medecin is one of the oldest primary care cooperatives. Again, they deliver primary care services 24-7. It's a network of on-call physicians. They answer 4 million calls annually and make 2.5 million visits also annually. Patients will pay for the visit, but what's automatically reimbursed by the, social or the uh, health insurance model. Chronic illness management, they have mandatory chronic illness care plans based on best evidence. GPs are actually reimbursed to coordinate care and oversee that care based on those chronic illness care plans. Uh, another very interesting model on, the long, uh, on chronic illnesses. Oops, sorry, I got that in twice or I went backwards. Innovation in Germany, another similar, you're starting to see the pattern and the, and the trending here. Chronic illness management programs, these are coordinated around six of the most prevalent chronic illnesses, again, based on best evidence. The general practitioners coordinate the care. There are incentives for both the consumers and the providers. So for the patients, they're incentivized, meaning they pay less in their health insurance annually if they adhere to and follow uh, these uh, chronic illness plans. And of course, providers are incentivized and are bonused if they achieve beyond what would be expected on the quality outcomes. They're expanding that model to frail elderly and multiple comorbidities. So right now they'd have one for diabetes, another one for cardiovascular disease, and so on. And now they're putting together a, a bundled uh, approach for the frail elderly. They also use, and a pilot tested this one three or four years ago, they had a bit of a rough start called a smart card. So we take a credit card and we just pay for a service in Germany. It's a similar swipe, chip-enabled card. Your entire health record is on that card, and you swipe so that there's an automatic on that screen 
record of every health interaction you may have had and uh, some of those records. So it, it, they access, it use a, you use a PIN, so the consumer carrying the card decides whether they want Dr. Bornstein to see that record or not uh, in terms of access. It had a little bit of a rough start, but a very interesting way of putting health information and wrapping it around people rather than having it live with a hospital or a community center that don't tend to talk to each other. The other inter interesting model in a visit I was recently uh, in Germany is the Policom Clinic. And this is a highly organized model. If you think of a Formula One team and a car racing team, when that car driver pulls into the pit, spot, er, pit stop, the entire team comes around that car and, and everyone knows what everyone else is doing It's highly efficient, very effective. That's almost essentially what the Policom Clinic model is. They have integrated specialist care, highly coordinated integrated home care. They have a call center staffed by a non-call nurse physician 24-7. Everybody works and enters data in the common health record. They have weekly rounds that are mandatory for every one of those specialists to attend. And they case conference people to make sure, each patient to make sure everyone's getting the best available care. It is even organized for physicians on certain floors of the clinic the physicians who need to be seeing patients most often are on the ground floor. The ones a little more specialized, less common, on the higher floor. Incredibly mapped out in terms of efficiency. Um, for elderly, they will send a car to pick up that elderly patient, bring them to the clinic at exactly the right time, and the physicians are scheduled to see that person. The person never moves. The physicians come in in a perfectly scheduled, organized team approach Every patient with a chronic condition must have mental health, health and wellness plan attached to their care plan in addition to every one of the other specialties you see on the screen. Everybody with diabetes must see the ophthalmologist and on and on and on. If someone does go to a hospital, the Policom Clinic lead physician goes to the hospital to make sure the hospital team knows exactly what that person needs and oversees their care. That's been actually scaled right across the country. I think there's 17 or 18 uh, of these clinics and it's really impressive. It takes a whole new um, definition of integrated care and a model I think we could really learn from. There is absolutely no such innovation in one country that you could drop into another country, but there's a Canadian version of an awful lot of these, no question. UK is an, another interesting, they have what they call a unique care program, not unlike the other countries. What they've done is taken the health budgets and the social services budgets, put those teams together, and created integrated models of care for their most frail elderly and tried to support them living at home. It coordinates all the care between health and social services, and they've seen very impressive reductions in the reliance on hospitalization. They also have a virtual hospital, and many countries have actually done that, where they deliver care at home to mitigate the need for care that would otherwise uh, be required for in a hospital. And they've gone to a whole model where they've essentially deconstructed the National Health Services into commissioning groups. So primary care GPs are in groups. They manage and make the resource allocation decisions on which patients get what specialty care, services, diagnostic tests, labs, and they have to work within a set of resources to do that. It's had a very interesting implementation uh, trajectory. When I go to England and we talk about this being innovative, the, the people in the audience invariably say, well, heaven's sakes, I wouldn't call that innovative. This is a, a nightmare. So they, they are a country that will completely deconstruct an entire health system structure and hope for the best, which is impressive given that we're a country that tends to be so risk averse, we're terrified about changing anything. Um, but it is a very interesting model and one of the things they're spending a lot of time on is supporting the GPs to make very good decisions. And the shift in power bot dynamics, you can imagine, is moving into the community because that's where the GP decision making is and out of the hospitals. And no question, no one can afford this hospital dominant health system any longer. And moving into very robust models of community care, which these last four countries have already achieved, is more than likely why their performance and quality outcomes as a health system at the national level is far better and far more impressive than ours has been uh, certainly to date. So what are the clear trends coming out of the OECD group? No question about it. Very robust models of community-based care focused on wrapping integrated appro service approaches around people. 
and people's needs. The most significant one that jumped out on this analysis for me was 24-7 care availability uh, around the clock from primary care. Australia has it. I didn't talk about them, but we looked at that. Uh, Germany, they all have access to primary care no matter what day of the week and what time of the day. Canada is one of three countries in the world I can find that does not have that. Cuba is one of them, I think, but I'm actually, it's hard to know because you rely on published literature, and Korea is the other one. So if there is one thing we should be thinking about, if nothing else, in our innovation agenda, which by the way, we don't have a national agenda, and there's only one province I've found so far that has a provincial innovation agenda, that would be British Columbia, is shifting out of the hospital, monies out of the hospital sector, creating these robust community models of care and making sure 24-7 accountability is in place. Every one of the wait times in emergency rooms in every one of these countries is a third of what ours is. Like literally, it's, it's staggering. And our lengths of stay are also the highest in the world. Uh, despite we having a, a number of hospital beds per capita among the lowest per capita. So Canada's got a long way to go, but fear not, there is opportunities. And uh, of course, I'm looking to uh, Newfoundland, actually, Roger and your group, figure out the robust mo model of care for a certain population, because I think you're perfectly suited. One of the, the interesting things in Canada is leading the future of healthcare, and I love this quote by Henry Ford. If I'd asked people what they wanted, they would have said faster horses. When we ask people in any health system what they would like, more doctors, more OR time, more drugs available, more all those things. We are not a population that's really entrepreneurial and thinking of we've got to do things different. We're very risk averse. And one of the things I think on our innovation agenda we've got to start to learn from is look at these other countries, figure out what to learn from, what's the Canadian version, how do you bring the policymaker, those health professional groups together, and the service delivery organizations together to really start to look at a common values framework that delivers value to the population we are serving, and more importantly, measuring what, uh, what the progress is in that. When you look at where Canadians' health values are, we're very much at the top of the a Maslow hierarchy of needs. They want quality of life, health and wellness. And where we measure a lot of our health system performance metrics is at the bottom. Did you survive? Did you have a medication error? Did you get readmitted? Did you have a terrible hospital acquired infection? And on and on and so forth. So in some ways, it's one thing to say, yes, we need to be innovative. It's another thing to say, what is the innovation model that's going to work in this particular province or this particular region? And how do you create the evidence that suggests that model is what we need and here's the impact it can achieve? And that's largely the work we're doing with the center. How do we transition to a health system focused on values? Well, for sure, one of the things we have to do is take the hospitals, get them to sit down at that same table with these community organizations, long-term care, primary care, and look at the person from the entire continuum of care, and look, stop asking what is, um, tell me what uh, the problem is, and ask them what matters to you in terms of achieving their health and wellness values. Part of that is also moving care upstream, so leveraging technology so that you can connect provider teams to the populations they serve. With, I mean, we do this with Skype. On, on all kinds of meetings and even professional meetings, but even family members. So the technology exists, it's actually right off the shelf. The challenge is how do you take that technology, embed it in the DNA of a health system so that it actually has longevity and achieves the value that it should be able to achieve now. At the moment, you can go online and buy stocks and bonds and do any banking transaction you need to. You can go online and book any travel car rental. You can even look at TripAdvisor to see if it's any good or not, a particular hotel or airline. You can't go online and do any of those things in healthcare. So really taking technologies that exist, they exist and have for some time in another, um, other sectors, and redesigning healthcare and focusing on the values that Canadians want to achieve. The second thing is we have got to reinvent and rethink performance. If we were measuring metrics around patient experience and meaning and what we're achieving for populations, and different measures may be needed for different populations. Right now in Canada, 
we have the first generation of Canadian children who may not outlive their parents because the rates of obesity are so high, they're going to be experiencing long-term conditions much early, much earlier, which leads to much less um, opportunity for a uh, very healthy population. Measuring metrics that track and achieving health and wellness for children may look different than for our seniors, but we need to actually start developing those metrics on, for any of them before we can start to understand impact. And they need to be at mapping on quality of life outcomes as much as they need to map on to prevalence of disease. So we know we can look at any region in the country and know exactly what the rates of very specific kinds of cancer. We can't look at any region in the country and know whether there's any variability in health and wellness, except what shows up in an emergency room. So I spend a lot of time with provinces on creating new metrics. I mentioned a moment ago, British Columbia has a provincial innovation and change agenda. It started in 2009, and we are partnering with them to measure what has it achieved. And what's really emerging very quickly in that partnership with the Ministry of Health there is we need a whole new set of metrics. Because disease-based metrics, life expectancy is just not going to help them know whether that e the investment in innovation has achieved anything. The other thing we need to do is look at incentives. You saw quality-based funding formulas in Netherlands and Germany and incentives for achieving quality. Building funding models that will pay, in some countries what they'll do is a physician will get 80% of their anticipated salary if they just hold the line on quality for a patient. It'll be 100 if they meet about benchmark at 50%, and they'll give them a bonus of 25% if they get that person to 80th percentile very different model and will drive a very different approach to care. The third one is shifting the performance metrics. Right now, everything we measure is around the health system. We measure very little around our patients. We don't know if they're highly engaged in their social networks. We have no idea what quality of life looks like for them and whether care coordination is happening. But we know an awful lot about how many physicians we have, how much we're spending on physicians, what are the wait times, and all those good things. So a whole shift towards that consumer-centric measure will be a very important one to know whether we're achieving value. And the other very significant shift is, is the role of our health professionals. We have been trained and socialized almost with the majority. Average age of a nurse in Canada is about 47, 48. That means we've been trained quite a long time ago, before Google, before Facebook, and before an awful lot of some of those social networking. We've been trained to be very prescriptive. We'll ask what's the matter when they come or we see a patient. We don't ask what matters to that patient. So transitioning more towards interprofessional models of practice to achieve and focus and drive towards quality of life, that Formula One idea from Germany, is absolutely a completely different way of practicing for most professionals. We don't socialize our physicians, nurses, and allied health in these models. But we, and we largely really need to look, I think, at our education system to figure out how to do that. The other thing we need to probably do is put them all in the same classroom, particularly for the basic sciences. Because last time I checked, physiology hasn't dramatically changed. And whether there's a physician sitting beside a nurse, sitting beside a pharmacist, probably a much better way to go. Because what we do now is we train them completely independent. Nurses just with nurses, physicians just with physicians, and on and on and so forth. We throw them into the healthcare system and say, now be a high performing team. They have no idea what the various perspectives are, and then we, we struggle with that, that interprofessional team. So I think we have a long way to go on that, and I would see universities as playing a very important role. Generally, what our center does a lot of work in health systems and partners around creating cultures of innovation rather than cultures of same old, same old, right? And we've recently launched an innovation ecosystem in one of the regions of Ontario. Stay tuned, I'll let you know how that works. We work all, uh, spend a lot of time building leadership capacity. You can't just decide in a healthcare system or a health minister, today we're gonna be innovative. It takes phenomenal leadership to drive forward and through the barriers and the hurdles, ask the critical questions, why do we always do it this way? I, one of my favorite early experiences in nursing was I was on night shift as a nurse in an intensive care unit, and I asked at rounds the next morning when we were transitioning out, why do we record the intake and outputs in five different places for each patient? 
one for the rounds when the physician team comes around, one on the little clipboard hanging at the end of the chart, another one in the charts, and on and on and so forth. So why don't we just put it one place? Everyone knows where to look. I stayed on permanent nights for quite a while in that job. It's, we don't ask those questions, and we are not in environments that are open to, that's a great idea, we should pilot test it and see if it works. We tend to be, no, it's always been that way. And we've always done it that way because we've always done it that way. So we've got to break that mold a little bit and be a little bit more open to change. And we most definitely have to start learning from each other. What Newfoundland figures out in terms of a model of care for seniors in rural communities could absolutely inform some thinking in rural Saskatchewan, rural BC, northern Ontario, Manitoba, but we don't talk to each other. Every time I come to a different province, I hear about really impressive, innovative work that none of the rest of Canada knows a thing about. So looking at ways to create that leadership pipeline is also about a learning pipeline, and we're not so terrific at that. We've created a model in terms of we run a lot of health innovation pro projects that are designed primarily to get from the proof of concept, the great idea, look at proof of relevance. Where could it be relevant? How is it relevant? Is it really relevant to patients as well as clinicians and to health systems? But then don't stop there. Take it to proof of value, proof of reimbursement. How could it get integrated, embedded in a health system? What kinds of IT decision support would it require? What performance metrics do we need to measure? What is the clinical practice um, shift that needs to happen? And how do families and patients respond or engage? And do they see value in it? So we spend a lot of time mapping onto uh, these projects in terms of measuring impact. And it's the impact that supports decision makers and ministries of health to decide whether a new model of care actually has some value. So generally, a long-winded, so I apologize for how long that is, but a long uh, discussion on all of the possibilities for innovation in Canada. There is no shortage of brilliant ideas, phenomenal clinicians, very, very creative students coming out of a number of our university programs. The issue is harnessing the innovation, finding ways to create the evidence for what does it achieve, what could it achieve, and then scaling it across health systems so that every province can benefit by that very significant talent that this country has, but isn't evenly distributed, of course, across an entire geography. It's taking the strengths from all of the provincial health systems, leveraging them so that everyone can learn from but, and tailor those approaches to the unique cultural, geographic, and population differences in the populations we serve. So with that, I'll close, and I'm absolutely happy to take uh, questions and comments. You can probably field your own questions. I could, yep. Yeah. Hand out the microphones. Yes, Dr. Butler. Thank you, and uh, being a family doctor, and uh, this is music to my ears, the National College of Family Physicians of Canada in 2011 put out a document called a family medicine home. Yes. The concept was we, a group of us thought that practice was becoming too fractionated. People didn't know where to meet the system. When they did see you in your office, the focus was wrong. Right. We, were, we were playing a game. And the fee-for-service system, with its focus on volume, misses, <laughs> misses the point. Right. And when it comes to older people in particular, and that's where yep. my area of interest is, the key element is having time to listen, mm -hmm. and then basically 90% of what I do is supportive listening. Right. And then sorting out the medical piece, which is the easiest piece. Mm -hmm. But our publics are, uh, they, they don't know. The system is, is dangerous. The emergency departments are fascinating. Uh, we don't have enough emphasis on primary care. Right. Memorial Medical School, at, at its low point, had 20% of its fact, uh, graduates going to family medicine. When I joined the faculty, just when the school was opened, we were a 50-50 school. Really? That's yeah, we were, very we were high. 60, 40, 50, 50. It was very close. And now we're trying to get back, and our dean has had a, a very progressive, uh, to try to influence the students on career choice. Mm -hmm. Right now, Newfoundland is spending more per capita than any, any province in Canada on health care per person. And we have probably the biggest deficit in family physicians in terms of real deficit. Right. We've got a very bad maldistribution between the city and, and 
rural <laughs> and in the city, uh, physicians have given up after hour service. Yeah. The reason why they've given it up is fascinating. I've been in a group that's provided 24 7 call since I've been in here in the city. And we, we do a little audit in our practice. 50% of my patients, I get a sign in my office, I'm available 24 7. After hours, I got physicians on call to cover my practice after hours. 50% of our patients still elect to go to the emergency department than to come to us. Wow. We have produced in this country a public demand on their own. Uh, they're, they're wanting to have technology. They know that the way to get it is through the emergency department. That's one thing. Now, the second thing is most, even more fascinating. Uh, five, it was about 10 years ago, I was a clinical chief in Eastern Health in rehab. I got a group of 10 to 15 physicians together, and we went to the health authority. We said, okay, our patients, our family medicine patients, are going to the emergency department in the evenings, 4 o'clock to 10, because a lot of GPs here in the city are closing their offices and going home 5 o'clock. So here's what we'll do for you, health authority. 10 of us will be available to you from 4 to 10. Just give us one of your shutdown outpatient specialty yeah, clinics. clinics yeah. And all we want is access to lab and x-ray on a secondary level from the emergency department. The emergency gets first choice, but, but our patients then can be seen, okay? So we've had, we got this, this thing, we say, and we will see those patients, and we'll send those patients back to their family doctors, or they need to be transferred or consulted with the appropriate counselor. These are all uh, experienced GPs, all with 20 years of experience, okay? These are not the people who are out just to drive the system. So I went to the chief of emergency as a clinical chief. I said, I've got this job done for you now. I'm going to take a lot of pressure off you guys in the emergency department. And the chief of the emergency said, you can't do that. Because? Because I will drop the number of patients going into the emergency department to make the health sciences a category B emergency department because they didn't have the volume. They would lose eight of their nurses in the emergency department. But the main reason wasn't that was because the two uh, consultants that were in there had to were depending on family medicine uh, fever service volume to pay their salaries. Right. So in other words, the system propagated itself. So and the funding model will actually drive the barriers that get in the way of better care. Exactly. It's it's actually hard to believe. But the other issue you're pointing out, which is a very interesting one, and it's come up a few times, but there's very little evidence. And if, and physicians will say this. What makes you think patients are going to follow those best practice integrated models of care that says you have diabetes, you need to exercise this much, and you need to you know, watch your healthy eating? Germany got around that one and says, guess what? You're going to pay less if you actually follow and work collaboratively with your pro provider. So it's really interesting when the value system in Canadians says, I want to partner with my health care provider to achieve health and wellness. And then that many people elect to, when they do have 24-7 care or coverage with a primary care physician, to go to eMERGE. Because the eMERGE department doesn't know them. They'll never see them again. They have no idea what medications they're on. Walk-in clinics, same way. Walk-in clinics propagate nothing but volume. And the only thing that happens with walk-in clinics is download to specialists somewhere, somehow, when it gets bad enough, to essentially it's the short-term fix, it'll get you through the weekend and then somebody somewhere else. So the funding models are no small issue in terms of innovation and the, the for sure requiring 24-7 but in, and disincentives to use our emergency rooms is, re, is really where we need to be looking. I'm interested in what you were saying about BC having a, an innovation Sort of model and change built agenda in, yep. built into their their uh, healthcare system, but I'm wondering about collaboration for innovation. How much international collaboration happens in Canada in in terms of people from other countries coming and having a look at our system, and how much dialogue is going on between Canadian health systems people and people from systems in other countries? Uh, to my knowledge, I don't see it very often. Now. Having said that, what Canada spends a lot of time doing is looking to our neighbors in the South. So the U.S. is this big and bold and impressive technologically and a lot of other things in their health system. They have the worst quality outcomes as a, as a 
system in the world. So it's a little bit like the, you know, the team uh, Canada being, you know, second from last place, comparing themselves to the last place and saying, oh, I feel so much better, right? <laughs> we don't nearly as often. UK seems to be the only one that I've seen where we actually will send people on study tours. I'm never sure what a study, study tour actually achieves, but I've yet to see a study tour also create a set of metrics that says, here's the evidence for that outcome, you know, that achieves something. So we don't look globally very often. We have much to learn from countries like India uh, because they're in a system where they've got 1.5 billion people, approximately 400,000 get health care, and that's because they pay cash up front before they see the provider, and the rest of the population just doesn't have cash to do that. So they've found some very interesting, innovative ways to do things for no money. They have a whole mobile health system. Everybody in India carries very inexpensive cell phones, uh, so there's mobile apps, and that is becoming their healthcare system. Um, the, but, but there are no question. We have much more. We have a lot to learn from each of our provinces. You know, BC's got a provincial innovation and change agenda at the Minister of Health level. He has no metrics to measure <laughs> he or she uh, what they're achieving, which is well, for me was like you know match made in heaven. Please let me develop those metrics because if I can develop them for that provincial health system. Let me just bring them to all the others to say, if this is of value, here's a set of metrics and a metrics framework you can use. The goal of that project is to create a dashboard. You open up your screen and you can see your top five or six outcomes by region, by province, to know whether you're achieving the objectives of that change agenda. So part of that's creating new metrics and part of it's figuring out what the current metrics can tell you that gets you to the new set. Because if you can't measure it, you have no idea what you're achieving. Uh, hello there. Um, I think it was Dr. Butler who just mentioned that we have uh, developed a, a patient culture of wanting yeah. technology, and that's one of the reasons people go to the emergency room. They have flashier toys and more computers and all the rest of it. That's right, yeah. so you can get right in as well. Could you talk about it? It was just one of the things that has been sort of uh, on the horizon for the past few years, this idea of an electronic health record. Yes. And can you talk about whether or not that's going to answer all of our questions or all of our needs, or if there are perhaps other innovative, less complex uh, yeah. technological efforts that could be useful? Uh, really fascinating. We are the lowest um, uh, electronic medical record adopters in the world. Not a tremendous claim to fame. The province of Ontario is the poster child for massive e-health investment and failure. Ontario is still trying to deal with that because they saw themselves as leaders for many years. Um, but when you look at countries who've invested the billions, and that number is real, billions, in creating these common electronic medical record frameworks, it has not achieved the outcomes they thought it would. They have invested a great deal of money and having all the hospitals talk to each other in terms of these electronic records and being able to send things doesn't mean they actually collaborate and make great decisions together and put patients in the center and wrap healthcare teams around. It means it might be faster to send the x-ray so that doctor, whoever it is at whatever place can look at it. And we've done that. Ontario's done that. We still have a growing and a very costly system. So that some of the thinking is, well, and one, one theory is, it's doctor's fault. So bear with me, Roger. I promise I won't. It, it'll get better in a moment. I hear this over and over and over again from particularly ministries of health. They say, well, you know, if the doctors would just get on board and cooperate. Interestingly, though, I just saw a keynote talk by a pediatrician in Boston. Boston's a hotbed for innovation in the U.S. They, they, they do innovation very well. He stood up and he gave a very compelling case that, you know what, it's not doctors. Doctors will adopt technology, and he showed stat after stat after stat of doctors' ability to use technology. Many of them depend on it for their practice, actually, in some specialties. But doctors are not too wild about adopting an electronic medical record system that's so poorly designed you can't use it or it takes five times longer than it does to scribble a note. And he showed a screenshot of their electronic medical record at Boston Children's Hospital. Again, pretty high-end organization. 
And on the bottom right corner, there's a button that says, do not ever press this button. So he, said, <laughs> so he said, now let me just get this straight. When I open my Mac computer, it's pretty obvious how to turn it on and off and what buttons you should press and great things happen. But we've designed electronic medical records that are so convoluted and badly designed, you'd be hard pressed to use them accurately because what software engineer in their right mind would develop a system that says, don't ever press that button. It's ridiculous. The other thing is, it is so difficult to use, they spend an average of $3,000 per person to train people to use it when they come on board as a new physician, nurse, or whoever. The company that wrote the software gets the revenue stream from the $3,000 price tag on the training. So he said, I can see why there's a vested interest in a lousy design, because it's going to require significant training, and the training drives the revenue stream once you've sold the medical record. So what we're starting, and it's just starting to occur to me, that maybe we dodged a bullet. We didn't adopt these electronic medical records. I don't know, you know, we could talk about why we didn't, but really, maybe that's a good thing. Because mobile health tools, electronic digital platforms, are, are out there in a lot of countries. I was at a keynote talk in the UK. There's seven electronic platforms just to help people and physicians connect to each other to manage their health better. And that was in one meeting on one afternoon. So those mobile health technologies, those digital technologies that are rapidly coming onto the marketplace are possibly the way to jump over this, this hurdle of the electronic medical record and has the added value of putting the patient's information in the patient's own hands. So when I land in a merge with my 87-year-old mother with Alzheimer's and, or one of my two teenagers that I have a son who's 21 who tends to do crazy things and gets all chopped up and needs somebody to stitch up something, I have no ability to tell anybody when's the last time they were immunized, when's the last time they had a tetanus shot, what meds is my mother on, because there's no electronic anything that, to, unless I create one and find the app and enter it. That, uh, that helps any of us make a good decision, right? But a mobile health tool now that's emerging, and a lot of it's in the private space, but the, it, it's a matter of time before it starts to interface with the, the formal health system where health information will start to flow. And that's when you get health uh, information wrapped around patients and families who need them to make very good decisions. And that's possibly where we're going to start seeing models of integrated care. Because as a patient family member, I can coordinate care really well if I know what I have to work with. Or I can connect to a Dr. Butler's clinic, or I can connect to a Dr. Bornstein's clinic, or I can get access to the care I need when they need it and how they need it, right? So it's possible that we might have actually bought some time by not adopting it, because a lot of other countries, UK will tell you first and foremost, we spent billions, we've achieved nothing in terms of integrated, better quality, better performance, uh, access to care. So. Good question. Hey. I am uh, vaguely. It's a small country of four million, and the, some of the New Zealand. I mean, Australia is very impressive. I've, I've, worked in, I've, I've been working with EMR for the last six years, and yep. I did a sabbatical in New Zealand. Eighty percent of all the physicians in New Zealand are under one system. It's a beautiful system. Yep. It saved me after I was three hours being serviced on this system. I went into a, a different country, yep. different medical system, and I could see as many patients as I see in Newfoundland and be out of my office in a half an hour quicker yep. with all my stuff written up. I came back to the system we have, which is very, very uh, archaic. It's not user-friendly, but we, I'm in the university, and because you could research every field on this computer system, we, we went into it because we could actually get some information back. But it's fascinating. The, the college did a thing now. There's a guy in Ontario mm -hmm. in the college who's looking at how to bring about efficiency in EMR systems. Yep. And it's garbage in, garbage out. Right. The big advantage is you can read the doctor's notes. The, the, the letters, yes. once yes. the data is in. But getting the data in is the problem. Yes. And uh, he, was, he was going through his, his experiences. And uh, in our system, it adds on. It added on to me an hour in my day, my system. It's so bad. But every physician, there's 10% of physicians in Newfoundland now on EMR. And you ask a physician who's on an EMR, would he go back to a paper chart? 
And they'll all tell you no. Because? The data is so much easier to organize. Yeah, yeah. You can follow your patient better. Yeah. And once we get the interfaces with the pharmacy and the labs, if they ever, ever can get a common system, yeah. that's where the real goal, that's real where the efficiencies yeah. come in. Yeah. Now, your system has to have that. Yeah. No, no question. Do you know, in most provinces, people don't know this, all lab data is housed and stored in a single depository. All lab data. The million dollar question is, why aren't we using that in a meaningful way to help clinicians or families figure it out, right? So, uh, absolutely, yes. Hi, I'm uh, Ted Rosales. I've been practicing in Newfoundland for 43 years. And I've seen, you know, all kinds of uh, problems uh, regarding, you know, how we all interact professionally and also a lot of problems with patients. Mm -hmm. the, I have two questions. When are we going to try and really educate our patients about their own health? Right. Because to me, what is really happening is that, you know, I got a toenail problem, you know, I got to see my doctor instead of really trying to uh, do something about, uh, you know, uh, the issue themselves, which doesn't need any medical attention. And lifestyle. Yeah. Lifestyle, you mentioned obes obesity. Mm -hmm. In my 40 years of practicing, you know, over 40 years of practicing in Finland, there's more obese people, children, mm -hmm. that I had, you know, seen. And the issue of substances, alcohol, mm -hmm. that produce so much problem. This is within our purview mm -hmm. to prevent it totally. And yet, because of very complicated issue, you know, we cannot tell a pregnant woman that alcohol and pregnancy do not mix. Mm -hmm. And that's why I'm not invited in cocktail parties anymore. <laughs> uh, so, I, you know, to, to me, these are simple issues that we can address. Yeah. And yes, what we're talking about will happen. But for now, next 10 years, Alcohol and pregnancy do not mix. And we will prevent, in Newfoundland alone, mm -hmm. 5,000 affected individuals. Yeah. No question. Lifestyle behaviors, and, and this comes up often. Uh, it's, we, we figured it out probably better than most countries on smoking, right? We are actually among the lowest rates of smoking of most OECD countries, if not the lowest. We've made it completely socially unacceptable to smoke, and we're not, and, and people are not, I mean, in the old days, you'd be in an airplane breathing 30 people cigarettes and wondering if you'll ever breathe normally again. So public policy has played a really important role on some of those lifestyle behaviors. The one that worries me the most, which you've pointed out, is the children. Kids and health substances another is one of the kids' issues, and the kinds of substances that are out there now are completely uh, different, the synthetic drugs particularly, than any of the uh, smoking and alcohol, which we used to worry about in, in the 60s and 70s. But ways we need to be building in our system to make those lifestyle choices just as socially unacceptable or find ways for people to make better decisions. The internet hasn't helped us in that one, in some ways. Our social networking, we've now, I mean, there's, there's lots of ways you can look at the internet and say it's a good thing, but, but I'm not so sure, actually. Mental health in youth and children um, that's correlating with social media use and bullying online is extraordinary, and it's relentless. And school bullying, it used to stop when the school bell rang and everyone went home. Now it doesn't stop. It's 24-7. And many schools are now online, so you can't even escape bullying and be at school because you're now online and the, you know, the Facebook, the craziness on Facebook. So, so the lifestyle behavior issue is, is substantive. Uh, the only one you didn't mention was mental health. 52% uh, of um, university students are now entering universities with a mental health diagnosis or history of one. And yet I haven't found an in, a university in Canada that's actually got an active, proactive strategy around 
strengthening and supporting mental health in these young people. In my own um, teaching for about 30 years, I am seeing exponential numbers of students showing up in my office with substantive mental health challenges, asking for what do I do and where do I go and how do I access it. So I think there's a combination of policy, structures embedded in our social systems, whether it's school and young children, youth in whatever school system they happen to be working in, and health teams with the expertise to take it on. One of the things we did as an innovation project, uh, Canada hosted the International Children's Games last year, and it happened to be in Windsor. And they wanted a legacy project. And of course, there's no money. Classic story. What could we do that's innovative, but we have no money? <laughs> So you do what all good innovators do, you make something with no money, and so I gave my MBA student class their project for the semester. Show me what you would do to support and strengthen children's health in Canada. And be as innovative as you possibly can. So what they essentially did was they created a social networking platform like, the face, like Facebook, only for all children's health, and they built into it point systems. So if you go and play soccer with your friends, you get 10 points. If you bring your mother and make her play, you get 30, because of the whole idea of families and, and health behaviors and, and anti-bullying. And how do you help your friend intervene if somebody's being mean to them? And you know, we had Olympic athletes on it in chat rooms and all those good things. We put it into the school system, the Windsor school system. Four school boards came together, never unheard of. They said, oh yeah, we want to do this. So we had to translate it into French, because two of them are French, right? And we put it in place, and schools started competing with schools, and you could get points for healthy eating choices, healthy physical activity choices, helping a friend and anti-bullying, mental health choices, and on and on and so forth. So it's going to where the kids are and creating supportive strategies to engage them, and then they learn, right? That's a matter of choice. You get more points for that choice uh, than this choice. So I think there's a lot, and we did it for literally no money. That actually platform, then what do you do with it, right? We found a Ability Online, which was a social networking platform with 20 years of experience, huge amounts of security, all developed for children with disabilities. We used that platform, and all of the school children from the four school boards came onto the Ability Online platform. It's reverse integration for the kids with disabilities, right? They thought they were invited to the world's biggest birthday party because 5,000 kids just joined their platform. They knew all the one, they had 2,000 kids on it, now there's 6,000, and everybody's uh, on the platform engaging and building new relationships. For the kids with disabilities, it massively opened up their social networks that they don't have and it's easily to access and maintain. So I think there's an awful lot of things, there's no one size fits all. I don't think what happens in one community will work beautifully in another, but I do think we can do an awful lot with very simple, strategies and collaborations across social systems and professional groups, and we tend not to do that. Health sticks with health, social services sticks with social services, education says, no, I don't do health, I do education. And, then I, and I, I've tried that. I've gone to school systems and said, look, leading cause of death in children is road crashes. Why? Because we don't put them in the right car seat, booster seat, seat belt at the right age, height, and weight. I spent 10 years on that went to a school system and said, can't we just embed it into your health curriculum? Oh no, that, that's not part of our curriculum. We couldn't possibly do that. We're all about education. I said, show me a successful kid who's not healthy. Because if, the one, if you have one, you need the other. So a whole bunch of interesting, oppor interesting opportunities, but it's really, if we did nothing else but pr pr um, lead a much more entrepreneurial culture, in our country, we'd be better off. When I did my PhD in Michigan, my final exam for one course was, write a business plan that's a revenue generating opportunity for a health system. I said, I said to my professor, that's actually illegal in Canada. <laughs> he said, I don't care, write it anyway. So we did, I learned to write a business plan as a doctoral student in nursing of, of all things, right? We don't socialize our students. In my class, they get a mark for innovation. Just thinking outside the box. And the most creative kids, they rise to the occasion. They solve real health system problems just by running at it as hard as you can with a little bit of help and support in a classroom. So I, I think there's a lot of cost-effective, simple, easy ways to get a whole population thinking about innovation and change in health systems. I'm sorry I made you wait so long. That's okay. <laughs> it's a nice, long 
segue. I'm going to come at this a little differently. You've raised so many points that Sorry I honestly that. don't know where to, to start. I know. To begin, <laughs> but I'm a political scientist, and like Stephen once yes. studied foreign governments, including some of the countries you talked about. My <laughs> question is simply, how do you get this going? You've suggested a lot of points, and yet I think of what to me is a very sterile debate. Most right. public debate in Canada yeah. is and has been for some time. Jeffrey Simpson's been writing the same column every yep. couple of months for at least a decade yep. with no change. Uh, ministers of Health got really panicky about wait times, and they improved it on five procedures, blocking emergency rooms access for surgeons who needed it elsewhere. Our system is small enough that I can look at some of the problems around ERs, which is about the last place I want to be. It's full of sick people right. and televisions with lousy programs on. Right. Uh, and say all they have to do is have urgent care in the East End, the West End, and out of the building, and they don't want to. Uh, and yet you could get people within five to ten minutes to the technology if you needed it. Yeah. I do get to talk to my doctor, but she isn't here. Uh, lots of people aren't here who I thought would have been here. Uh, people in the Ministry of in the Department of Health aren't here. Uh, they pay a huge price. Yeah. I can figure out that if your hospital's ERs are jammed because the wrong people are in there, and you can't get others out of the hallway that you need to do it. But I'm applying a method of planning that the French used in the late 40s and 1950s, looking at bottlenecks that I can right. see right. from somewhere else. So how on earth do you get this going? I see governments running large systems, health, education, social services. Those are 90%, 80% of the envelopes yep. uh, that don't work very well together. Right. Uh, and if at, at all, them. actually. They're so silent. It, how do you get it started? You know, it, it, there's, in some ways I wonder whether Canada has been too complacent for so long because we didn't have to change the system, right? There was a lot of money around healthcare systems uh, in the 80s, 90s. There, nobody ever questioned whether we had, you know, too, we're spending too much money on hips and knee surgical OR time. When you ask the question, so what's going to make this difference? And what's going to actually catapult moving forward and accelerating? Right now in Canada, it takes approximately, and this would be the mean, between 17 and 25 years to take an innovative anything, idea, device, or technology, and embed it in a health system. 17 to 25. What will likely change the system, the scary part is which direction it'll go, will be 2030, 2035, when the costs of our current healthcare systems will exceed 50% of the tax base and be closing in on 70. Because there's no new money in this economy, there could be less money, right? So as a business school would say, and many others, never waste a good crisis. Essentially, we're getting to the edge of the cliff I think. And for the first time in my professional career, which is many more decades than I care to admit to, the ministry is saying, what do we do? What do we do? So ministries of health, like it's remarkable to me that I'm attached to the BC Minister of Health to figure out the metrics he needs to measure whether his innovation agenda worked. I think that's great. Wonderful for me, right? But, but that wouldn't have happened 10 years ago. Minister of Health in Ontario is now put together the Ontario Health Innovation Council. Taken 12 people that know something about health systems and innovation and say, give us the strategy. I'm on that council. And the funny thing is, six of the members of my center are on the council. But that's good news. So I think there's a burning platform. And I think the fire's getting hot. The policymakers are struggling with what will work. So they're looking for some evidence that says that model is the way to go in Newfoundland and a version of it will work just fine in Saskatchewan, thank you very much, and on and so forth. That doesn't exist very many places. Physicians will say, no offense, and nurses are just as bad, maybe worse, 
When I was chief nursing officer, if I had a dollar for every time the nurse says, we need more nurses. And the only answer I could give them was, no problem. Tell me whose budget you want me to take the money from, and do you want to explain to them why you need more nurses and we need less people in radiology or whatever, labor and delivery. And they suddenly said, well, we can't do that. Then I said, okay, there's no new money. So you tell me, start moving things around and tell me what the right model is and show me the evidence it works. Suddenly people get kind of quiet. So, you know, interestingly enough. So, and lots of people in many provinces will say the government needs to figure it out. Now that's the Henry Ford example, right? You know, the other Ford Motor Company, and you can tell I live in Windsor, so I'm very automotive oriented. Lead, follower, get out of the way. If we really believe the government is going to figure it out, that worries me. Because the government doesn't actually know what the impact of that model of care is really going to look like for that group of nurses, that group of physicians, or this group of allied health. And nobody for sure is talking to the population to say, what's going to work for you? When, the poll, when you look at the polling data in a bit of detail, going back to your question, and I apologize, I'm not answering it entirely directly. Canadians are actually willing for trade-offs. And they're willing to say, well, if we put more money into the system, what does it get? Me? And so that there is an interesting tension there. They, want, they are willing to actually spend money on health, but only if they see evidence of the value proposition. The CBC did that ratemyhospital.ca last year. They couldn't get people to, they couldn't get health system players to respond to that survey. Like they begged, they pleaded, hospital CEOs embargoed says, no, not touching it. Well, if you're not even going to go online and have the courage to say, these five things could work, because all the patients are online. They had about 10,000 people, and they still do, writing in with suggestions for things that could be better, faster, smarter, more effective. So we're not even very good at weighing into the dialogue around what should we try. There's no silver bullet. There isn't a country I've been to in the world that thinks they've nailed it down, although their performance metrics look an awful lot better than ours do. There is very clear evidence that we need to look across very siloed groups of people. Policy on every innovation project I run at our center, policymakers are on the team. Private sector is on the team. That scares an awful lot of people, particularly universities and clinicians and ministers of health. Academic teams are on the team because they're the only ones I know that have the expertise in creating evidence and metrics. And health system leaders and families and populations, those health systems deliver care to. When you put them all together, it's a fascinating discussion. The industry, the industry guys are really good at that business thinking. You know, return on investment, how is it going to get paid for, what does it deliver, how do we know it delivers that? Perfect. They, have, they just have no idea how a health system works. And they'll say, well, just make the doctors do it. It's like, um, okay, that's probably not going to work because they're actually not your employees. And I know at General Electric there are your employees and you can make a lot of things happen. But in a health system, physicians not necessarily employed. And some, they are, of course. So when you put them together, you've got the business thinking, ROI, some of that pragmatic skill set we desperately need. We've got policymakers, and we can, be the, we can figure out the most innovative models in the planet, but if you don't have a policy to support it, like reimbursing models and that kind of thing, and incentives to drive quality so it doesn't become a free-for-all, you're dead in the water. Health systems have a lot to learn, and, and health teams need to design the future practice for themselves. The last thing nurses need is for policymakers to tell them how to be a nurse. Same with physicians, same with allied health. But, but health professionals seem to be least likely or able to tell you how they would design that new model of care because we're so entrenched. Are you coming over here for a reason? <laughs> Sorry. Not that one. <laughs> oh, I'm so I'm disappointed. Time, as you say. Yes, absolutely. Uh, and thank you for an inspirational Thank somewhat you. scary uh, <laughs> and sometimes quite depressing presentation. It, it's it's uh, meant to be motivating. <laughs> it was terrific. Thank no, you. No, it was my much. pleasure. And I uh, welcome ideas and collaboration wherever that may work for you. And uh, thank you ever so much for spending some time with me today. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you, folks.